So for the third and final piece of our uh, lecture on concrete, we will look at a uh, precast. Uh, this is a, a species of concrete defined more by a when and where it's made than what's actually in it. Uh, the mixture might be the same, but this applies to elements that we are actually fabricating off-site and then bringing to the site and assembling instead of pouring it uh, in place. So again, like we said last time, instead of actually making the muffin on site, we're making the muffin first and bringing it uh, to, the, to the building. Um, it has a lot of the same advantages because it's the same material. Uh, so it is fire resistant. Uh, we get the expressed structure that we sometimes like. It comes with a, a, a fire rating. Uh, and it uh, has a lot of the, the same structural principles as concrete. So very, very good in compression. We can make it good in tension and bending uh, by putting reinforcing it in. It allows us to make progress on a job even during adverse uh, weather conditions. So it can be raining or snowing, the humidity can be wrong. And because we're making precast often within a factory, we can control the conditions where the element's actually made. And when we put the thing on uh, together on site, it doesn't really matter so much whether the weather is bad or not. Maybe more difficult to assemble, but it's not going to affect the quality uh, of the finished product. And finally, the most important thing is that we're taking a lot of the time that is spent on site where things are messy, they're subject to weather, uh, it, they're expensive and often uh, very confined. We may not have as much room uh, as we'd like. We're taking a lot of the effort and we're putting it uh, in a factory and we're taking it offline. So it can happen, uh, the, the, the fabrication of these elements can happen while other things are going on uh, on the job site. And a classic example of this is we might be making the structural elements in a factory while we are digging and pouring foundations. And so we're telescoping uh, the amount of time that it would take to actually pour uh, the entire construction. And for a mid-rise building, uh, precast is relatively quick. It's competitive uh, in the sort of four to 20 story range. The problems with precast uh, relate exactly to the, the fact that we are building the building basically out of small parts. Um, we have some of the same issues that we do with concrete forming in that even though we're doing it in a factory, we are limited in the precision and in the, the kind of tolerances that we have. We can't really design details that are smaller than, say, the largest piece of aggregate in a mix because that piece of aggregate might get stuck in the form and we might not get the, the precast concrete exactly where we want it to go. As a result, it's hard to make stiff connections uh, in precast concrete. We're bringing finished products to the site. They're kind of big, they're kind of bulky, they're not very precise. We're assembling them almost like kind of Stonehenge uh, fashion. And as a result, as you can see on the left, uh, when we apply a lateral force to a typical precast structure that has no other bracing, we get that kind of racking that we uh, know is both bad for the structure and, and bad for operations. If you look on the right, you can see uh, how a lot of our detailing gets done in precast. We will cast columns with these big kind of uh, brackets or shelves, and we'll literally just put the girders or beams on top of those. There'll often be a, a embedded steel in both of those that lets us weld or bolt them together. But as you can see, there's no real good way to get the kind of monolithic connection that we would get if all of that had been poured uh, as one piece. The reason that we use it uh, despite this is that we can do things that we can't do out of port in place. We can uh, cast very, very large pieces, truck them to the site and very quickly get uh, long spans in place that would be difficult if we had to say build 100 or 200 feet of, uh, of form work. Um, we can also uh, cast complex forms because it's in a factory, even though we're limited in the precision that we can uh, use we can be more accurate. And maybe more importantly, uh, we can make mistakes in the factory that can be easily corrected, right? If we, um, if a piece comes out wrong, or even if a piece that is uh, supposed to be architectural concrete comes out with a finish that's not acceptable, uh, that piece can be cast again with minimal impact uh, on the job site. If we were doing that out of concrete that was cast in place, we would have a big fight about whether the concrete had to actually be torn out and poured again. That would be a delay not only 
of the time that it took to tear an element out but also it would slow down the entire process because we would have to wait to pour maybe the next entire floor uh, to correct the mistake. Precast mistakes happen in the fabricating plant. Um, there'll still be maybe disputes about uh, how much the, it, it would cost to recast a piece or how much time it would take, uh, but it's less affecting the, the critical path uh, of construction that it would be uh, with poured in place. When we uh, are precasting, we're usually contracting with a, a precasting yard or a precasting factory, and we have a couple of things uh, to consider. Um, one is the kind of space and the abilities of various precasters. Some will specialize in uh, structural concrete, others might specialize in architectural. Some might be able to cast pieces in, you know, piece in uh, sizes as large as we want. Others might specialize more in, um, in, in smaller scale materials. There will be various uh, expertises in uh, how they cast uh, in terms of finishes, in terms of color, and maybe most importantly, uh, there will be firms that specialize, for example, in precasting really large pieces, not so much uh, because of the difficulty of doing it in fabrication, but remember all of these pieces now have to get shipped to the site. And so fitting a precast piece onto a truck, onto a barge or, or whatever else is bringing it to the job site uh, is important and is tricky. There are limits to the sizes, both in terms of width that we can put on an interstate highway. There are certainly limitations uh, in terms of length. All of these things will affect the way that we design those elements and the way that we design the overall structure to be out of a kind of kit of parts uh, of, of things that are produced over and over again. There has always been a kind of emphasis on repetition. It's easier for precasters to use one mold again and again and again. That is changing because of uh, digital fabrication, but it's not changing as quickly as in some other materials because precasters still use a, a palette of molds that include things like fiberglass and timber. They still have to fabricate the molds in order to fabricate the parts. And so even though we can get maybe more complicated forms or we can handle variety a little easier, there's a cost associated with uh, changing the shape of the elements, even in a small way, um, when we're engaging a, a precaster. We'll generally talk about precast in a, a number of uh, types of elements. So one of the most common is uh, load collecting, uh, slabs and girders in particular. And one of the most popular uses of precast concrete is what's called a hollow core slab. This is a, a, a floor slab that, as you can see, is, is cast in very long, flat, uh, wide segments. And you can see, too, that they either have hollows cast into them or sometimes have hollows drilled out of them uh, as they're cured. And if you look at the sections, you can see that this is a, a particularly effective way to make a floor slab we're basically making a very, very long one-way slab out of a whole bunch of linked concrete I-beams. So you can imagine that these vertical elements work like flanges. You can imagine that these, or sorry, work like uh, webs. You can imagine that these horizontal elements work like flanges. And this is basically working like two I-beams, one there and one there, and two channels, one there and one there and they are all linked together. So they're all performing as one-way elements, but they are linked and their collective resistance to deflection is giving them some characteristics of a two-way slab. The other way to think about this is it's like a, working with a floor slab that is this deep, but where we're taking out all of this dead weight. And remember the thing that limits us in concrete is typically the material's self-weight. It's such a dense, heavy material that the problem we often run into is the concrete carrying itself over a span. So anything we can do to take material out, and here you can see that the voids in a hollow core slab are centered on what becomes the neutral axis of that slab element. Anything we can do to take out material that's not working hard is going to increase the efficiency. And as you can see, uh, these slabs here are probably 35 or 40 feet. They're gonna span uh, one whole column bay of a concrete structure. Um, some variations. Uh, here's our hollow core slab, and you can see that it is analogous basically to a, a whole bunch of linked I-beams. We can also use what are called a T's and double T's. 
And these are analogous, of course, to T-beams, right? They are T-beams. Uh, the double T basically has one, flan or one flange and two webs. Single T here, this is one web uh, and one flange. The advantage to the T-beam, it's less efficient structurally than a hollow core slab. Uh, it's uh, usually deeper, uh, but you can see that there is proportionally less material, right? We, we're, we're using probably a little bit less material and thus saving a little bit of weight. And we also can access the resulting voids. We can put things like mechanical systems and lighting up into the voids uh, of a T-beam. We don't really have any good way of accessing the voids in a, in a hollow core slab. So there are some minor structural efficiencies uh, in terms of weight. We're paying a penalty in terms of the overall depth usually, but we're gaining in terms of the potential for integration. We can combine mechanical systems and structure into one sandwich, which we can't usually do uh, with hollow core slabs. We uh, also use a precast for supporting elements or load grounders. So uh, elements that take the weights and the loads on the floor slabs and direct them into the ground. So here we have uh, precast columns and you can see that typical detail where we have a bracket cast into the column and you can imagine that taking all of the gravity load uh, of those girders and having difficulty taking any resistance to lateral forces, right? A, a, a fairly loose detail, one that is aimed clearly at taking the vertical loads and not so much horizontal loads. We can combine these the materials too. We can, here you see hollow core uh, slabs grouted at the end to close the, the voids off, sitting on top of steel structures. And that is perfectly okay. We can switch materials uh, as we're sort of going down the, the structural hierarchy. Um, oftentimes, though, we will stick to one material, if nothing else, just for uh, ease of coordination on the, on the job site. And this is an example of precast slabs, precast girders, and precast columns all working together. Here, looking at that detail a little more closely, this is fairly typical uh, for a, a precast system. You can see that the column here has an integral set of uh, steel reinforcing. So these square, they're analogous to stirrups, along with the bars themselves. Those bars are taking whatever slight bending loads that the column might undergo and also contributing to the, the, um, the, the compression capability. Um, you can see that the stirrup there, that is keeping the bars in place, preventing them from splaying out uh, under loading. Uh, hollow core slab elements. Uh, the, these have a groove along the side that uh, takes reinforcing bars. Notice that as they're going over a column, the reinforcing bar is on the top. That's where the tension will be as they pass over a column monolithically. You can see these are grouted together. There's probably some reinforcing that's going to connect them and make those work sort of like a, a, a continuous uh, slab. Here in the girder, uh, you can see a more typical uh, pattern of reinforcing for uh, 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 a spanning element. Lots of reinforcement uh, in the bottom, some here in the top. This is mostly, uh, in this situation, this is mostly there to take the stirrups that are uh, handling a lot of the shear load. And then here is this uh, bulky and sort of loose uh, connection that is taking the gravity load of those uh, floor elements and spanning elements and putting them into the column. Uh, angles that are uh, cast into one piece or the other uh, and then welded together. And that will connect them, it will hold them together. It won't do very much uh, in terms of giving them a, a moment connection. So we have to find some other way usually to stabilize uh, a fully precast uh, structure. Here, a slightly different system. This is a, a T system, so precast double T. And these are uh, particularly uh, effective at long distances. So they're used in freeway construction a lot, bridge construction, um, but we might use them for uh, industrial uh, situations or if we need a long span like a, a gymnasium or something like that. 110 feet is uh, certainly possible. And as you see here, the span to weight ratio is why we, we would typically use these, right? That they are uh, putting less load onto the, the girders and columns that are carrying them uh, and then onto the foundations. Steel is almost always going to be lighter, but if we've made the decision to go with concrete, particularly precast, 
Uh, for a roof element especially, we might use a double T precast beam and slab. Here you can see this is the slab element. It is integral with the T's, and you can see here uh, where the reinforcing, reinforcement bars are cast into uh, the, the, the double T's. So a uh, little bit of a comparison. We can certainly do uh, flat slabs that do not have hollow cores. Uh, again, usually in even numbers of inches, four, six, or eight. Flat slabs typically are cast in uh, four foot uh, widths. And as you can see, they can span up to about 24 feet. If they're well reinforced, uh, they, we uh, have a span to depth ratio of about uh, one, to, one to 40, or 40 to one. Here for hollow cores, uh, you can see typical uh, width dimensions up to eight feet. And again, slightly deeper dimensions, uh, usually six to 12. And you can see here that we can go up uh, a little bit further, right? Almost twice as far uh, as flat slabs. And that is because the savings in weight, taking out all that material uh, around the neutral axis. Similar uh, depth to span ratio, one to 40. Um, but we are uh, able to go much further, right? Better performing uh, slab system. Single T's and double T's, typical dimensions here, um, 20 inches to uh, four feet. You see typical dimensions for the uh, topping slab and typical widths. These are usually limited by what we can put on the back of a truck. 10 feet uh, is usually the limit for shipping. So we're limited not necessarily uh, structurally, but we're limited in terms of, uh, of transportation. And here, a uh, double T, uh, again, you can see that these go up to about 32 inches, two inch topping slab. Uh, and these can span, as you see here, single T's up to 120 feet, uh, double T's a little bit heavier, uh, up to about 100. Span a depth of 28 to 30, so more efficient in terms of uh, how they're using that depth than, uh, the, than the slabs themselves. Uh, for beams, um, again, usually we have some standard dimensions. These come from the, the jigs that precasters use in their, um, in their factories. Usually, again, even uh, numbers of inches, uh, depths that are fairly standardized, two feet, two foot six, uh, up to 40 inches. The girders here are, are typically spanning up to uh, 75 feet, and we have a span to depth ratio that we expect when we're looking at beams and girders, uh, one to 15. That's what we, in, within the sort of one to 16 uh, range that, that we usually uh, think about. And then here, these are freeway girders. You're probably familiar with these uh, on the undersides of, uh, of freeway bridges where we're approximating the shape of an I-beam with a shape that's easy to remove from the forms. So all of these chamfers are designed to allow the finished piece to separate from its forms easily, just like in uh, poured in place concrete, but here uh, in, in factory conditions. 60 feet is usually uh, the span depth here, and we would typically expect a 1 to 15 or 1 to 16 span to depth ratio uh, with those sorts of girders as well. So here are rules of thumb that you'll use uh, for the lab. Remember a minimum of two inches uh, on the topping slab, um, less than we might have in on, uh, on site because we can place the reinforcement uh, more precisely. We're not so worried about the reinforcement maybe not being in the right place and not having that uh, inch of protection. If we're placing it in the factory, we can be more precise and we can actually shrink the, the topping slab that we would need. So here, uh, rules of thumb, one to 40 uh, for flat slabs, but limited in uh, their dimensions, uh, their, their spanning dimensions. Hollow core slabs, one to 33, and then one to 28 for single and double Ts. When we get to beams and girders, we're talking about our normal uh, 1 to 15, 1 to 16 uh, rule of thumb. And then here for columns, 10 inches, 12 inches, uh, all the way up to 24 inches. That again will be subject also to what the unbraced length of the column is. If we're doubling the story height, then obviously we would need to uh, increase the, the diameter or the, or the width of the, of the column. Here, uh, columns, again, the, the issues with these, we can cast whatever we want into them to take any combination of, uh, of girders and slabs. But as you can imagine, these are, are connections that don't allow us to get a lot of, uh, of lateral stability. So instead of rigid joints like we would use in, um, uh, in port in place concrete, we usually pair precast uh, systems in multi-story buildings 
with shear walls that, that are usually poured in place. Uh, they can be made out of precast, but very often we pair the two. So we'll have a, a poured in place shear wall system and then a precast gravity system uh, with columns and, and girders. Here again, we can uh, pre and post tension uh, concrete. So if we're doing this um, with precast, obviously we can do it more, more readily than we can uh, trying to cast concrete around uh, stainless steel tendons. Remember, this is a type of super reinforcing where we're using uh, not reinforcing bars, but actual steel cables usually. Uh, and after the concrete is uh, cured, um, we're using the ability of that steel to take a great deal of tension to basically squeeze the concrete together, to put it into so much compression that when it is fully loaded, that compression will actually balance out the normal tension that we get in, in bending. Um, the other way to think of this is just we're putting uh, post-tensioning or uh, pre-tensioning in where we know we're going to have a really tremendous uh, bending load, right? We put it in the beam where we know there's going to be uh, that tension. So two ways to do that. Um, we can uh, cast the concrete around uh, raceways, and then we can um, uh, tension before the concrete is set, which makes the concrete into an arch form that eventually flattens out. We can also uh, pre-tension where we're um, actually tensing these tendons before uh, the, the casting. And then once it's uh, set, we're actually snapping that, letting it go, and letting the, uh, the, the, the pre-tensioning in the cable uh, press the, the, the beam or the girder together. You can think about this uh, like this guy here. This is from August Commandant's book. Commandant was the, the sort of pioneer uh, of this, uh, this type of structure. Um, if you uh, have a whole set of books that you push together uh, really hard, what you find is that those separated pieces actually work together really well, right? The, the friction of them actually holds the thing together. In addition to getting the benefit of that super tensile capacity, um, we're gaining a lot in the shear that the uh, unit can actually withstand. These are typical uh, units that are going to be post-tensioned. You can see here, these are the ducts where the uh, tendons or cables will go. Uh, and then after all of those are in place, they will get um, tied to anchors and, uh, the, and using jacks, uh, the jacks will actually stretch the cable and then let it go. And the, the anchors on either side will put uh, all of that concrete uh, into, into very, very deep uh, compression, giving it these kind of uh, souped up uh, capabilities. Um, here are uh, a couple of uh, examples of precast walls. This is a way to get some lateral resistance uh, into a structure. Um, the, here you can see these are being propped up. This is before I'm imagining floor plates and a, and a roof deck go in. We have to worry, of course, about the stability of these, not only once they're all together, but as they're being uh, assembled. And here you see connections analogous to the ones we saw on columns. Uh, here cast into a precast wall panel uh, that will take a series of girders that will then take the, the floor slabs that you, that you see here uh, down below. Putting these in place, you can see that we're subject to some of the same site problems that we get on any construction site where things may or may not be perfectly accurate. Uh, a precast piece that's done in the factory should have pretty tight tolerances to within an eighth or a quarter of an inch. The problems we run into are when we are trying to put that onto cast-in-place foundations or cast-in-place structures that may or may not be as accurate as the, as the precast. Um, but these units, you can see uh, hollow core slabs here being put onto a, a masonry and concrete wall, here being put onto what's probably a poured-in-place concrete wall. And when we're assembling those, again, we will have typically some embeds. So here is a, um, uh, an angle that uh, both uh, closes off the end of the, um, the hollow core uh, slab. We've got some grout in there as well to prevent vermin and things from getting into there. We can add a strip of insulation or something, or we can have uh, steel elements that allow us uh, to connect them in, in a way that is um, not completely rigid, but at least makes a, a kind of a sure connection. Here you can see we might have uh, shims or bearing strips that allow us to level that floor uh, more easily. And you can see their guidelines for how big that bracket uh, 
uh, needs to be, one 180th of the clear span to prevent uh, any movement in the span from uh, allowing the, the slab to fall off the, the end. And here, a typical detail for a structural T, where you can see that, again, we've got a bearing pad connecting the, uh, the girder to the bracket. That allows for any inaccuracies or, or some movement. Uh, and then here you can see on the top, we have uh, some embedded steel both in the T and in the column, and we have an angle that's going to weld the two together uh, and make them uh, not monolithic, uh, but at least connect them permanently. Um, as our engineers are designing these, they will design them not only for their finished position, uh, but also for everything they might endure as they're being shipped to the site and hauled into place. So this right now, even though it's designed as a vertical wall, um, that has to carry its own dead load over that span or it's going to uh, fail, right? It could fail in bending if we haven't accounted for all the positions that it might be in as it's being put into place. Architectural situations, we don't have to worry about this quite so much, but this is a big deal in, say, freeway construction, where you might have a very, very long single T that can't rotate out of plane very far, uh, or it'll lose its section modulus as it rotates, and it'll actually become a less efficient beam uh, and collapse. Here, uh, as the piece goes through fabrication, transportation, storage, and erection, the, our engineers have to think about reinforcing it for all the positions that it might be in this in these various phases. So we'll finish with um, one really, really good case study. Uh, this is a con building that was engineered by August Commandant. Uh, the first time that the two of them worked together, they would go on to collaborate on uh, Salk Institute, Kimball Art Museum, among others. Uh, Richards was uh, is a laboratory building at the University of Pennsylvania. It's very well known. Uh, in Khan's career for being the, the building where he really developed this idea of servant space and served space. So brick towers containing all of the ductwork and things that make the laboratory go, and then kind of um, more specialized laboratory space, or sorry, more open laboratory space that is clear of all of the uh, ducts and the, the machinery uh, that would otherwise clutter it up, right? All of that is stored in these brick towers. What I want to look at, though, um, is the, the set of columns and beams here that you see expressed on the exterior. These are all precast, post-tension structural units, um, fabricated off-site, uh, driven to the University of Pennsylvania, a site that had very little space uh, for, for a construction yard, and put into place sort of just in time. This was in uh, 1960, 1961. None of this sort of building information modeling or uh, or a lot of the, the um, tracking software and things that we would have today. So very critical that there was a, a kind of casting process, a storage facility, uh, and then the ability to bring pieces one at a time so that cranes could be used uh, to their sort of maximum capacity. Um, here you can see some of Commandant's early drawings. Uh, he was fascinated by the idea that because you were doing these in precast, you could actually cast uh, what Khan would come to call hollow stones. So mini Virendil trusses that would run between these precast columns. And those trusses uh, having these rectangular openings could then house all of the ductwork. So even though this is a relatively th uh, deep structure, a uh, foot and a half or so overall, um, Khan and Commandant are able to use the space that that creates to weave all of the ductwork for the laboratories. Uh, into, into that interstitial space. Um, it also allowed this kind of uh, tinker toy construction. So a kit of parts, uh, deep Virendil girders, smaller Virendil beams, and then uh, tinier elements that create the sort of floor joists, if you like. Um, even the columns are precast, and all of these are post-tensioned together. So as these little building blocks get, uh, get build uh, complete girders, there are stainless steel tendons that go through them and that are tightened up, uh, not only to give them greater uh, capacity to uh, take up bending stress, but also to really squish them together, to make them perform uh, as monolithic elements, at least across that, that span. So here's one flying into place. This reinforcing here is going to be connected to reinforcing in the topping slab, so there'll be some uh, monolithic behavior, that slab will give it some uh, diaphragm action. And then here you can see the openings for what will be 
uh, the Virendil trust. The columns will go here, here, and then that trust will span uh, be between those. Here is the, um, the post-tensioning operation. So these are completed precast elements. These are the tendons sticking out. And you can see these are the hydraulic jacks that are gonna tighten those tendons and then let them go. And the ends of the tendons will pull basically giant washers together and put the bottom of the beam, the area that would experience the most tension in bending, it'll put the bottom of the beam into compression all the time, right? It, or, or you can think about it as the, the tendons taking up much more tensile stress than simple reinforcement could. Worth saying this is an expensive process in part because there's specialized equipment, uh, but also because an engineer, and this is Gus Commandant right here, um, the engineer has to watch uh, and measure the stress in the, in the tendons uh, as they're uh, being jacked up. And when they come up to stress, it's the engineer who says that it's fine to, uh, to, to turn off the jacks and actually cut the cables. So you can imagine paying for a licensed structural engineer to be on site being part of the cost uh, of a post-tension structure. And here you see the sort of tinker toys going together, right? It became part of the building's uh, expressive uh, palette as well. Um, tied in with a central core back here that is all floored in place. And this central core does in fact give much of the laboratories its lateral uh, stability, right? These uh, towers, even though they're post-tensioned are relatively loose. They all rely on that uh, poured in place central core to take up the wind forces that would otherwise uh, rack and push around uh, a, a tall, fairly loose building uh, that's made out of precast like that. So precast today uh, is, uh, we largely use a lot of the same techniques. Uh, as you've seen, a lot of the details uh, and, and systems look pretty similar. Uh, but of course, precast in connection with digital fabrication has all sorts of possibilities. And in addition to uh, digitally fabricating uh, molds and formwork that can allow for much more complicated uh, 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 components. We have the ability to literally 3D print uh, in concrete. We can do this uh, maybe on site. On the left, you see a couple of examples where this has been attempted. Uh, one of them on the top left, purely speculative. Uh, on the bottom, you can see what the, the sort of state of the art in uh, 3D printing concrete looks like today. Um, efficient, sure. Uh, this is a serpentine wall that has a particularly good structural capacity because it's wider at the base, thinner at the top. Um, as you can see, not terribly precise and uh, subject to a lot of the same issues that we have with wet construction in general. Uh, where that nozzle um, puts concrete out, it may be spitting out a big piece of aggregate. It may be spitting out more sand. And so we're going to get a lot of variation, as you can see, both in texture and also just where that ends up being. On the right, uh, two maybe more uh, uh, promising technologies where we're 3D printing uh, concrete in, the, in factory conditions or in the lab and able to make components that are much more either precise. Um, here you see uh, 3D printed concrete elements being stitched together in a very efficient uh, truss shape. And this also has architectural possibilities. So here, a uh, much more kind of aesthetically driven idea about pumping concrete out in ways that give this element uh, a particularly kind of warm sort of woven texture. So even though concrete is one of the oldest uh, materials we have, um, even though we think of it as a generally kind of um, uh, crude sort of handmade material, uh, there are ways that digital technologies are uh, impacting it in ways that we can garner even more efficiency or even more expressiveness uh, out of a material that is thousands of years old.